Take another photograph and document a life that's right. And ways consist of simple things, the days of black and white. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back yet again to Talking Go Podcast with me, your host, the man with the plan, Ruben Django Pouch. How's it going? You well? Welcome back. Have a look around. We've had a fucking facelift, huh? Those big plans I was talking about, this is them in manifest or a part of them. Some of those plans, here they are in manifest. We've had a paint job. We've uh, put in some beautiful uh, LED lights. We've got a plant. We've got a talking guff pillow. We've got our talking guff light box. Our bits of artwork. A beautiful painting by my own mother, Jean Pouch. A beautiful painting by my own cousin, Ben Barry. And um, what else have we got going on here? Let's see. Oh, we've done a job on the couch as well. So here we are. It looks like a proper studio, huh? What do you think? Put it in the comment section below. Do you like our new facelift? So, um, I just wanted to take a minute to pay some respects to a couple of people who have passed away recently. Number one is a Mr. David Gallagher. Um, David Gallagher was a chef and a, a, a rep for Redmond's Foods. But I also know Dave in a different capacity because he was really good friends with a friend of mine. A guy who I played in a band with for years. And Davey would have been knocking around with us when we were playing gigs and all. As a friend of my friend, Hooks. And... Um, a really lovely guy, super genuine, nice guy, only 53 years of age, lost his battle with cancer. And so, you know, rest in power, Davey, you're going to be missed, bro. Um, and then also, my boss, his father passed away this week. Um, I didn't know my boss's father, but um, my boss is one of the nicest guys I've ever met. And he had a great relationship with his father and it, and it, and it knocked him for six a bit. So I just wanted to say big up and rest in power, Mr. Walsh, all right? Um, I know a couple of young lads, real young lads, and they're over there in Canada. They've only gone over there recently to make a name for themselves in Toronto. And I meant to give them a shout out before, but I forgot to. So here we go. Big shout out to G Diddy and Jack, who are over there in Toronto making a name for themselves. They watch the podcast. I hope lads these are spreading the word about talking goof podcasts and introducing people across the water to what we're doing here in Bray County Wicklow. Uh, I seen a thing there, right, and uh, and it's a bit contentious, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. But I seen this thing where there was an article that said something along the lines of fellow RTE presenter hits out a Tommy Tiernan for controversial zoo joke. I think that's what the headline was. So I tapped into it, and I quite quickly realised that the that the presenter in question, a is a person of colour, and b I know her. She's from Bray, right, and. She went on with this bit of a spiel, basically, about because Tommy Tiernan uh, told a joke that she felt cut too close to the bone. The, 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 the punchline of said joke was something along the lines of uh, taxi drivers, you know, taxi drivers in Ireland are predominantly African. That was basically the, the, the crux of his punchline. And there was just something about the article and her narrative that, that smacked a bit for me. For first off, I was like, well, how come this how come you've gone to the mirror with this? And, and apparently she'd actually first posted on Instagram, then the mirror contacted her to have a, a chat about it. But there was like a part where she was like going, oh, it started off and it was great. There was Irish music going on. I was feeling so patriotic, whatever that means or whatever relevance that has to the situation sort of escapes me actually. Um, but then she went on to say that the joke he told was really upsetting and that she had to leave the gig and she was upset because she she didn't expect this the Vicar Street to be an unsafe place for her. And as the only person of colour in the audience, she felt um, that she had her Irishness taken away from her. Now, I find that hard to understand, I suppose, because he's not saying, oh, look at your one down there. Her dad's probably a taxi driver. She's not even Irish or anything like that. He just, he made this uh, racially insensitive joke about um, taxi drivers. Um, but... N- Again, I just I failed to see how it was directed at her. And I thought some of the language being used was a bit woke. And I thought some of the ideas she was uh, promoting or, dis- or the narrative that she was describing was a bit of a stretch, to be honest with you. And it seemed a little bit self-involved. All right? And now that might be a controversial thing to say. But I have noticed previous to this situation that this girl who is a an, an, uh, racism campaigner, and fair play to her, more power to her, 
I just thought that I think I had thought before that she was being over the top or or laying it on a bit thick. And could she in fact potentially be laying it on a bit thick just to elevate her own profile? And then, like I said, I saw this article and I thought maybe potentially more the same. Is this about um, actually dealing with a racist situation or is it about rising your profile and having your name in the mirror and having your name on news talk? I don't know, maybe I'm being totally cynical and a total wanker, but that's what I thought a little bit, right? And then another part of it is I've no doubt that this uh, girl has been a victim of... um, some malevolent like uh racist shit i've no doubt there are malevolent little wankers out there who spew um fucking toxic diatribes all the time but those little wankers they also spew toxic diatribes about other people and how they're different do you know what i mean like those little shits who go around being racist they're unhappy essentially i'm telling you and I'm not validating or condoning their behavior. It's just though, when I look at a situation where you have a nice house, you work for RTE, you've been on, on the telly and all in an ad, and we'll talk about that now in a minute, I just find it hard to believe or hard to see how you're a mad victim of systemic racism, right? Because that's another thing that this girl says. And I went on to her Instagram profile to read the original post about the Tommy Tiernan joke. And then I just was scanning through another couple of bits. And she also did an independent TEDx thing in Wexford. And I watched a few minutes of it. And it was about unconscious bias. And I thought that this also was a stretch, right? Because the first thing she does when she comes out is she goes, Hi, I'm such and such. And she's got a pure Irish sound name. She's like, but I know what you're thinking. I'm not your typical Irish looking person. And I wasn't thinking that at all. I I didn't say that. Now I know this girl. So it's probably like, you know what I mean? Because I know her, uh, maybe my interpretation or perspective of her is colored. And I know she's Irish. I know she's Irish or whatever the fuck. But I just thought that that was, I was just like, well, no one said that. You're the one who's come out and said that I look different. And another thing about it is like, is that necessarily a bad thing? Like I don't look quintessentially Irish. And when I was doing... Like, I work in kitchens with working class immigrants and especially when I was doing the takeaway thing and we'd be using just these drivers. They'd just be turning up these drivers and I'd be like, all right, bro, what's the story? Sit down there and I'll get your, what number is it? Right, you sit down there and I'll get that order sorted and we'll get you on your merry way now in a few minutes. And they'd be looking at me going, where the fuck are you from, bro? I said, what do you mean? You're not Irish, are you? I'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Born and raised here in Brain, they'd be, their minds would be blown. They'd be like, you don't look Irish. And I liked that. I wasn't going around going, did you just assume my ethnicity, you racist fucking immigrants? And so, <laughs> and so like, I, I thought that was a bit much now within the TED Talk. And, and then she also goes on to say that she has sickle cell, right? And that sickle cell is a disease that is... Pre- and I wouldn't have known this now, but this is what she said. That sickle cell was a disease that was prevalent among people of African descent. And that we don't... Um, that here in this country, we don't test for sickle cell because predominantly people aren't of African descent. And she didn't realise she had sickle cell until she went on a full scholarship to America and they tested her there. And lo and behold, she had sickle cell. And that in and of itself is systemic racism. That was the implication I understood from what was being said. It's like, oh, you know, that's racist. because, And it's not like you have an overstretched uh, health service that doesn't test for things that don't usually come up. It's just like, no, because you don't test for sickle cell, which is predominantly prevalent in people of African descent, that's systemic racism. And again, I just thought, Jesus Christ, that's a bit of a stretch. And I suppose the thing I take a f- exception to is just this idea. It's like, until I educate you, you're racist. I said, like, what the fuck? You know, and that comes up because she went on News Talk after turn Tommy Tiernan and had an hour-long conversation about the situation and, and, and really resolved the issue. And then... She went on the news talk after the fact that sort of hammered at home, I felt. And she divulged parts of that personal, private conversation between herself and Tommy Tiernan. Maybe she has every right to, and maybe Tommy Tiernan has no problem with that. But I just thought that, again, it's just like, it's just making it a bit self-centered. Or it's just like hammering this thing home a little bit that I'm finding it hard to see that I think is a bit of a stretch. Like I said, this girl was in a Circle K ad recently and when I I saw the Circle K ad before any of this came up and I looked at that ad and thought, Jesus, that looks like corporate token wokeism. What? Let's get a mixed race family in here and just have them drinking Coca-Cola and eating the buns and all. I'm thinking, isn't this great? And like if I was 
if I were to follow that thread thought process and just go, does, does that mean that you got the ad based solely on the virtue of your skin color? And if that is the case, does that mean that your skin color was actually of advantage to you? And here's the thing, like I said, I've no doubt that people have been total assholes to this girl, but I also know, like, when I was coming up, she only a year younger than me, she was fucking beautiful. And all the lads I know really fancied her. And another part of the, the news talk conversation that she said was just like, employers are literally putting resumes in the bin, she said. I have a friend who changed her last name to her husband's Irish name and all of a sudden started getting these job, these calls for jobs. I mean, I suppose, again, I might be naive or cynical, but I would find it hard to believe that employers are literally putting resumes, resumes in the bin based on people's skin colour. And then it says, then people have been really open in conversation saying, yes, I might cross the street on a dark night if I'm walking and I see a person of colour. I mean, I wouldn't, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. But also, people might cross the street if they were on a dark night if they were walking and see a fucking dangerous looking cunt who was white you know what i mean or a dangerous looking cunt who was asian or anything like that it's just like that i, I don't know i just i find that hard to believe that that conversation is happening and then yes this is another co frank conversation that people have had with her yes i might judge them and think they're not educated and they're leeching off the system I just find that really hard to believe that someone actually said that to her. And maybe, again, I'm being naive. But I also think that some people, those, maybe if someone did say that to her, that they might also look at the jelly heads who are all white down on Bray Main Street and think they're uneducated and leeching autism. That's a judgment. Do you know what I mean? And she said the housing crisis and the increase in migrants arriving in Ireland are stoking a lot of anger from our far right that is kind of coming out in this altogether racist rhetoric. It is very harmful, I suppose, to communities, and I think it's important that education is there, the awareness is there, and the support for communities is there. So I suppose what I'd say to that is that in this country, we're probably one of the only countries in Europe who don't have a fucking, a real, like, tangible far-right element, especially not in the government. We've no fucking far-right party that gets anywhere like they do in England, like they do in France, like they do in Italy, and I think that's something we should take stock of and actually be proud of in this country i remember when the bmp fucking lunatic came out from england to have a fucking nationalist rally that the counter rally was 10 times as big and working class fucking lunatics from sheriff street chased them lads off the streets of dublin and bet the bollocks out of them do you remember that and so again i'm not saying racism doesn't exist in this country i just would have a hard time thinking that it's systemic like we have a fucking we have a brown t-shirt you know what I mean? And everyone hates him, but not because he's brown, because he's a fucking sociopathic, you know, financial elite dickhead. But again, like I said, and this idea that, oh, I'm terrible, because here's the thing that keeps coming up in the last few months, I suppose, and I've talked about it every single time. It's just like, and it's usually women, you know, a, 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 an ex-girlfriend of mine who was raised in a fucking hardcore affluent home up there on Kilcrowney Lane and has a good job over in London, a nice place, a nice fella and all. She's a victim of the patriarchy. I went to my school reunion. A girl who's had a fucking great job ever since we left school. She's really intelligent. She's uh, worked all over the world. London, Paris, New York, back in Ireland now, living in the most affluent, leafy suburb of South County Dublin telling me she's a victim of the patriarchy and then there's someone who works for the government in a nice job for rt has a degree nice husband good kids nice house in the uh, ads on the telly and everything and again she's this this victim who's had a terrible life and i'm just i don't see it why don't you go out and have a look around like go out to sheriff street well and, and look at the, at the working class uh women uh, there and see how 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 their situation has been detrimental to their lives how being born and dragged up through poverty is also a fucking really difficult situation to deal with everyone has it fucking bad in different ways and again i'm not validating or pooing or belittling racist elements within this country they exist i know they exist but they're a finite group of dickheads doing that shit I believe, and I could be wrong, but I also think that what this girl is saying um, is traumatically racist is a fucking stretch. All right? And I might be totally wrong there, but what does anyone else think? Um, <laughs> where are we going? What are we doing? What do you reckon about these things? What do you reckon about the things we're about to say? What do you reckon about these things? What do you reckon about the things we're about to say? We've lost it, have we? Where's our watch and reckon sheet? Ah, bollocks. 
<coughs> That's the team tune, by the way. What do you reckon about these things? What do you reckon about the things we about to say? So I watched the story, JFK, man. I watched JFK, the Oliver Stone movie with Kevin Costner in it a while ago. Just the other day, it's back up on Netflix. It's fucking deadly. I forgot how good it was. And I suppose I watched it years ago when I was young. And then I was like, oh, and I was like, wow, holy fuck, is that the situation? Is that what actually happened? And then people were like, no, no, look, that's not real. That's all, blah, blah, blah. But it is based then, I didn't realize this, it's based on the book by Jim Garrison, who was the district attorney for New Orleans, and he did bring Clay Bertrand or Clay, what a Shaw, whoever it was, to court for a conspiracy to kill the president. Like, that's all definitely a fact. And I suppose when we look around the world today and how that the CIA and the NSA, like, control the government in America and the president of America is actually scared of them motherfuckers because they will kill you. That's what they do. What were you what? You're dead, mate. He killed himself. He committed suicide by shooting himself in the head twice and all this stuff. But when you see that there seemed to have been some sort of... Um, effort to stifle the truth uh in uh, during that situation in 66 or 67 whenever it was it's just sort of when you look at that situation it's like oh that's where it all started all of the dirty deep state fucking political weirdness that we now are like that we're now um living in that was born really just uh, with the death, with the assassination of John F. Kennedy. It's a really interesting film. It's fucking deadly. You should watch it if you haven't already watched it. What did what did, what do you reckon? Also, Dances with Wolves. Because I was watching this going, Jesus, Kevin Costner was great, wasn't he? And then uh, I was like, do you know what one of my favourite films ever is? Dances with Wolves. Which is pretty much Avatar, funnily enough. But then I was like, you know, you never see it anywhere. You never see it on Netflix or Amazon or any of these things. And then I was trying to find it. I was making a concerted effort to find Dances with Wolves and watch it again. I can't find it anywhere. And I can't watch it anywhere. What do you reckon? Do you think James Cameron has done that on purpose so we won't make the link between Avatar and his and Dances with Wolves? Although Avatar is Pocahontas and it's all those stories. There's only two stories. Um, but what do you reckon? Dances with Wolves is cracker, you know? What do you reckon? Another thing that came up was now it seems that Biden has been found with confidential documents in his um, garage, in his home. And that's exactly what Trump was accused of before. And I was saying at the time that apparently that happens all the time, that you're allowed to take certain documents home and leave over them, etc., etc. And everyone's like, no, it's Trump. He's trying to fucking sell them to the Russians or whatever. And now it's like, oh, actually, Biden's got more of that shit in his gaff. It's mad, isn't it, that? Anyway, what do you reckon? And then another one, this is more like a question. Spotify. I want to get the podcast onto Spotify and other platforms like that. How do you do that? What do you reckon? What do you reckon is the best way to achieve that? Let me know in the comment section below. That's the end of what do you reckon for this week. What do you reckon about these things? What do you reckon about the things we're about to say? Okay. What else? Oh, yeah. So, obviously, there's a fella out there in the world called Andrew Callahan. Started off doing a, things called, a thing called All Gas, No Breaks, right? And um, <coughs> an interesting... Or he's just released a documentary about two or three weeks ago that I haven't yet watched. It's called um, This Place Rules. And it's basically... It's just a documentary covering his journey through Channel 5. Because All Gas, No Breaks, he got ripped off with that. And he started a thing called Channel 5. It's been going well for him. He's just released a feature length thing on HBO. Where others at his feet. And then a woman comes out on Instagram and says she was sexually assaulted by Andrew Callahan, right? And it's like, oh my God, what's the story here? And funnily enough, she even she says in the in her Instagram post or Twitter post, I can't remember, but she says in the post, Oh, he got his he got his consent, alright. But only because he badgered me. For or coerced me for hours. And I thought, well, hold on a minute. You just said it there, love. He got his consent, right? And I just thought, this is the scenario, basically. Uh, he's talking to some bird. He says he's had some issue with the people he's staying with. Can he come and stay in her house? She goes, yeah, no problem. They get into bed. They're in their underpants, maybe. And he's like, can I have the pussy? And she's like, no, no, you can't have the pussy. And then he's like, oh, please, give me the pussy. 
will you please give me the pussy? Can I please have the pussy? And this goes on for hours, and eventually she goes, okay, you can have the pussy, and he gets the pussy. And then he goes on with his life, and he releases this movie, and all of a sudden, the person who gave him consent for the pussy, she says that he sexually assaulted her, that it was sexual, it was sexual crime. And that is fucked, in my opinion. I'm sorry, because then loads of other girls came out and said, yeah, he tried to get me to have sex with him loads as well. And a person came out and said, coercion is sexual abuse. And it's just like, no, it's not. It's coercion. It's begging. It's, 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 it's pleading for the pussy. But it's not sexual abuse. When you say, yeah, you can have the pussy, then you can have the pussy and you can't say anything about it. Just because you didn't like it or you look six months later and think his life's going all right, isn't it? I'm going to fuck his shit up. And I just thought it was mental because, like I said, people are like, coercion is sexual abuse. And then another person was just like, and this is a fucking thing that drives me mad, I'm sorry, but it's just like, we must believe the victim. And it's just like, well, two, that's too foul. Number one, what if the victim's a liar? What if the victim, the own, like, because surely, like, you make an accusation, we use the judicial system to figure it out, and then if that accusation uh, stands up, then you're a victim. But just, I could go out and say anything. And, oh, I'm a victim because um, this person did this. And then people just are meant to believe me by default. That's for me, is fucking insane. Of course we're not going to do that. Of course we shouldn't do that. Not just believe outright. We should give space and a safe place for people to make these accusations. But they have to be founded. It can't be like, yeah, I gave him consent, but he sexually abused me. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? What the fuck? What fucking planet are you on? And I suppose, like... And apparently now, Andrew Callahan's gonna have... Is, like, having a nervous breakdown, etc., etc., etc. And again, I suppose I don't really give a fuck, but I just think it's... We're in a world where we just want to rewrite things. It's just like, oh, I told him he could have sex with me, but he raped me. Because he coerced me. Well, hold on a minute. That's totally mental. You know what I mean? And I've got a really good life. But because I'm a woman, I'm a victim. I've got a really good life. Because I'm a person of colour, I'm a victim. It's just like, come on, lads. It's a fucking hard world we're living in. Why don't you go over to Aleppo and talk about victimisation? Why don't you go over to the women in Afghanistan or Iran right now and tell them you're a fucking victim? You're struggling in your Western paradise with your good job. You know what I mean? Give me a fucking break. That's not... That's bullshit. And... Like, that Andrew Callahan throws up a whole litany of fucking really dangerous and scary things. It doesn't bother me. I'm 38 years of age. I'm not trying out there trying to get pussy. But I've got a son who's 10 years of age, and he's going to go through puberty soon and get erections and masturbate and want to have sex with people. And I'm not saying he should just go out and club moths over the head and drag them into his cave and bang them. But I also, like, I'll also probably be having conversations with him because, like, it, this comes up so much. It's just like, oh, yeah... I had sex with that lad and te- basically I regretted it after the fact and now I want to fuck his life up by calling him a rapist. And like, and like, whether you like, say for instance, and it, we saw it, it happens like on a local level, like where lads are just like going home with like, you know, might go home with a bird and they're having drunken sex and they fall asleep and they wake up and he's got a big bone around and he's sort of rubbing it into her leg going, come on baby, can we get, go for round two? And she's like, hold on a minute, what the fuck are you doing here? And he's like, what, what are you talking about? Like, Did you rape me? And it's just like, whoa, no, you brought me back here. We had sex. I'm trying to have sex again. There's no rape going on here. And no, no, that's rape. And you're just like, what the fuck? And it's like the same with the Chris D'Elia thing. And I don't think Chris D'Elia is that funny and I don't necessarily like him. But when it came out that, like, he only talked to, like, the whole, his apparent crime was just like, He'd rock into town, he'd go on to his, into his DM, see who wanted to have sex. Which I think a lot of men, especially single men, would be guilty of in his situation, right? Same for the chap from Arcade Fire. Just rock up, uh, any, any groupies on the go? And you might think that that's deplorable behaviour, but it's not illegal. You know what I mean? And you can say whatever the fuck you want. No crime has been committed there. And even in the situation with Crystalia, when one of the girls was like, oh, I'm only 16, he was like, well, sorry, get me the fuck out of here. Straight away. Like, you know, this is not to catch a predator. And 
it's just that the lines are getting totally blurred, you know what I mean? And I'm going to be having conversations with my son, like, when he's older, just be like, bro, it's not worth it. Do not have sex with a stranger that you meet out on the town. If you do, you'd want to have fucking waivers in your pocket and or a f- take your camera phone out and be like, can we have sex? Yes. Okay, cool. We're going to have sex now, yeah? Yes. Done. Like, literally, that's the world we're living in and it's fucking dangerous and it's hard. And do you know what else it does? It disenchants young men and it sends them out, it's a, you know, it makes them idolise characters such as Andrew Tate and stuff like this. You know what I mean? That's what happens when you keep going... Oh, those male thoughts are having, they're bad rapist thoughts. And if you want to have sex with women, if you think it's all right to talk about women's tits and pussies, you're a rapist. And that's rape culture. And you're a horrible human being. And you should be ashamed of yourself. Like, you men out there are just going, oh, fuck, what am I going to do? Because I do want to look at her tits. I do want to have sex with her fanny. I must have something wrong with me. Or either that, or they're like, fuck them bitches. You know what I mean? It's just, we're not going towards a place of, like, understanding. It's just... And it's all a setup. It's all just put in place to divide us. Um, and that's it, really, for this week. I just wanted to talk about those couple of issues that I felt, that I felt, to wrap it up, I just felt that those two situations we've talked about were being presented as something they weren't. They were being presented as to be far more malevolent and dangerous than they were. And I might be naive, or I might be a misogynist, or a bigot, who knows, or a racist, But I'm pretty sure I'm not those things. I'm pretty sure I'm a person who just wants to use logic and common sense to make my way through the world without too much drama. Because I don't need that shit. I don't need to handle stuff. I just want to get on with it. So look, peace, love, respect, unity, all that guff, man. We're down with that here at Talking Guff. But we're also, we're not going to, you know, we want people to be realistic about their expectations. And we want people to be realistic about how difficult the situation really is for them. And we want people to take stock for of where we are and how blessed we are to be living in this country. And to not have to struggle, fight, survive just to stay alive. Alright, that's, because that's going on all over the fucking world. And the other thing is... It's like when you're posting all of these um, uh, outraged diatribes about how awful men are and how awful Tommy Tiernan is, you're posting that on a phone made by a fucking brown slave made with minerals extracted from the ground with bare hands by young black and brown children. And you want to talk to me about how awful it is, how much of a victim you are? Take a fucking, you know, wake the fuck up. Anyway, look, like I said, peace, love, respect, unity. I love everyone. I love you for watching it. I love you for not watching it. Mwah. And document a life that's right. And ways consist of simple things. The days of black and white. And faces from a humble past at one with the ground.